This is the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. Hello, everybody. This is Trevor. Scathingly, Paul. Paul, how are you doing this morning? I don't know. Not, I'm not feeling quite that aggressive, actually. I'm feeling very welcomed. And, uh, uh, yeah, there's <laughs> no scathing this. I'm not sure why that was my introduction of you this time, then. I, yeah. uh, I must get it wrong sometimes. <laughs> you must. Your mood ring didn't work today, but... <laughs> All right. Well, Paul, it's good to see you. We're both, I know, very excited about this episode. As are many of our listeners, uh, we are recording our special episode on the Mooks and the Gripes Summer Book Club uh, on Natalia Ginsburg's The Dry Heart. Uh, we are joined today uh, by Merve Emre, who is, every time that I read a book that I like, or that I'm excited about a book that's just been published, I'll go and Google and see what's being said about it, and inevitably, mm-hmm. Merve, you have already written about it, talked about it in depth, uh, already, you know, building up my excitement even more. Uh, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm, I'm, oh, well, that's a very, that's a very nice way to introduce me. Thank you for it. I really, I really appreciate it. I'm doing, I'm doing well. I'm in New Haven. It is 10 p.m. My husband is still trying to pull my children out the front door (laughs) because I can hear their screams in the distance. And if you hear them, (laughs) Uh, but thanks guys for having me, for having me on. I, I love the books that you that you talk about, and I often actually discover new ones through through you as well. So it's a very it's a very mutual kind of readerly relationship, and I oh, appreciate I w- it. I would never have expected that, but it's no. good to hear. It is good to hear. <laughs> and we are also joined today by Kim McNeil. Uh, Kim, I st- I kind of think uh, Kim came up with the hashtag Dry Heart Summer for mm-hmm. this, and I think had we gotten on that sooner, we could have beaten the Barbenheimer. Um, hashtag <laughs> for the summer, the be- the biggest summer hashtag, because that's just kind of brilliant marketing. The, the you know dry heart summer. Thank you for that. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, we definitely should have gotten got on that sooner, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Kim is also responsible for the NYRB Women Twenty Three, which I've mentioned several times on the podcast. As uh, I, I am still a hundred percent, except for this morning, I haven't read. Um, any of the 10,000 things this morning. But yes, Kim has put together that list of 24 books. And I I saw recently, you're already uh, kind of brainstorming NYRB Women 24. This isn't going to end, huh? (laughs) I am, yeah. I am because I still have a huge pile of unread books and I've had several people uh, message me. But I think we might just do one a month next year instead of two Mm. a month just to allow for some other reading as well. Oh, I, I what's your it. favorite what's your favorite one that you've read this year, Kim? Oh, that is a tough one. We've read so many different kinds of writing and different um, time periods and stories. I really enjoyed the diaries of Iris Arrigo, um, her World War II uh, diaries, which I, we read both of them back to back, and so that was really interesting. And we read it in conjunction. Um, the next month we read More Was Lost by Eleanor Perenni, and those were interesting in discussion with each other. So it's been kind of fun to have books that have been in discussion with each other and, and how that just kind of enhances the reading experience. That's wonderful. That's yeah. Wonderful. I feel like you were guided. I mean, every time we read two books together, I mean, these are perfect pairings. Even this month with, um, uh, we just started the 10,000 things, which I didn't know anything about. I thought it was going to be a fairly, you know, back to normal after reading, uh, the really wild stories and Silvina Ocampo's thus were their faces, but Holy cow, that is that I find myself just as disoriented. <laughs> Yes. I'm I'm thinking you must have known something about this. To to I didn't, actually. A lot of the books I put in the order I did because of just the year that they were published initially, um, because I thought it would be interesting to kind of read consecutively. Not all the books are that way. And um, but it so a lot of it is just by happenstance, which was Mm -hmm. very fortuitous. (laughs) I don't know if I believe that, Kim. You've got spreadsheets on top of spreadsheets. You're always planning. I, I am organized, but I was not that organized in this anyways. I have my sheet, but it came together very organically. We're going to start the theories, though. Next year, 
we're going to see your machinations of your mind at work and in, in directing our reading again. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I've, I've got a lot of feedback on what people want to read. So I'll try to incorporate some of that. Uh, I think it's been, it's been excellent. I am a big proponent of, of it uh, because it's gotten me to read a lot of books that I've had on my shelves that I've thought I should read that sometime. Mm -hmm. And it's also gotten me to reread some old favorites or even some that like, I read uh, several years ago, and I've kind of had the hankering to see if it was just me um, and get back to it. I think of Leonora Carrington's The Hearing Trumpet, which was, again, one of these kind of strange ones that I didn't I didn't understand the first time. And I didn't understand it the second time really either. <laughs> but I, I really enjoyed rereading it and getting more out of it and through the discussion. So I really appreciate that you've, you, you're sharing this with all, all of us. Oh, well, it's been great to have you participate and just every it's fun to have people that are rereading and reading it for the first time with a lot of the books because it just gives us different perspectives and stuff, too. And I love that experience of rereading. I feel like the older I get, the diff, the more different things I draw out of every reading experience. And I think that makes for a really interesting um, just overall group read because we have so many different people interjecting thoughts it's it's really fun well and Merve just so that you know and I mentioned this a little bit because I wasn't sure if, if if you you know wanted to talk about your recent breakup with Twitter um, <laughs> but you seemed to say it was okay and that you had a little bit of a, of a story but there have been plenty of people who have written to say oh tell Merve we, we we miss her tell her to come back some of them think that you maybe maybe it was Twitter you know you you made Elon Musk mad or something like that <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no. I think that I, what happened? Well, I should say I have a very uh, devoted friend who's also one of my graduate students who, uh, after she saw that I had deactivated, immediately wrote to me and she said, listen, I don't want you to regret this. So why don't you give me your username and password and I can reactivate and deactivate on your behalf every 28 days. So if you do <laughs> you can so someone has she she has my information now and is, <laughs> and is uh is is stewarding is stewarding the uh. account in case i do want to in case i do want to return no i think it, it it was really for me more i mean two things one one was that i do think the changes in the algorithm i'm sure you guys have experienced this too they do affect your enjoyment Mm -hmm. of the site and i just you know to 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 see you guys or to see kim to see your posts i would have to search for you mm -hmm. and even that wasn't working very well like i would search for kim mcneil and like 20 other people would come up and then i'd have to search for exactly your exactly your username and so the functionality mm -hmm. felt quite it felt like it was getting worse and worse i don't know if you've had this experience too but for mm -hmm. me that was that was one part of it. And then I don't know, man, like I do think sometimes the general level of discourse on there is so low that it makes me think the worst of people. <laughs> and I really like thinking well of people. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not someone who likes going through my day-to-day -day life uh, thinking that people always have scores that they want to settle or that they want to scold other people or that they kind of get off on their pretentiousness. And that's especially true when it comes to books for me. Mm -hmm. I, and so there were just a couple of rounds of, of, of discourse that made me feel, I don't know, they made, they made me feel demoralized about the way that people were talking, uh, especially about literature on there. And I thought I need a break from this so that I don't think the worst of people. And what I want to do is interact with like you guys on a show like this, where we're actually talking in a more face-to-face -face way mm -hmm. than we would be through the platform. But it was funny. I was at, I was at dinner last night with a friend and her husband, and he is someone who is very online. And he was trying to explain to me what I had missed this week. I <laughs> missed this whole controversy about how like under socialism, nobody will have bananas. And then people were like, you can't take bananas away from my kids. And I was just like, Jim, 
this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and then we were like, we should have a show called This Week on Twitter, where someone who's very online explains to someone who's not at all online what happened. And you can actually see what kinds of conversations manage to like break the barrier mm. of, um, of, of very online myopia. It's so, always, it's I still it. like, I, I think what you've done is fantastic. And oh, thank you. It's always sad when someone leaves. Mm. I remember, um, you know, Banana Karenina, um, Elif Batuman, when, when she was very active on Twitter. You know, mm. I loved, um, I loved that. And, and, you know, I think she came back after years to say she'd started a sub stack. Yeah. And that was kind of fun to just see her for a second. But it's always sad when someone leaves. It makes the place uh, worse. But it was, it. It has not been making me happy either. The the, yeah. the rate limiting that one Saturday, I wake up and I already can't read tweets, and I'm thinking this just doesn't this just isn't working, yeah. um, and where things seem to be heading. So, I, but I'm glad that we we do you know we do still have many avenues. And you'd you'd ask before you left, you know, does anyone have any suggestions? Do you have plans to share like links to what you're doing anywhere in particular? Uh, I mean, I feel like we can find, find them quite easily. They, like I subscribe to a lot of the YouTube channels where you do the, you know, um, appearances with, with authors or to discuss book releases and certainly with the New Yorker and various other things. I see your, your work, but I'm wondering, you know, is there anything like that in the works that you want to share so people can find you or is it, we'll just do what we can. Um, no, I don't have, I don't have any plans. I mean, the, the thing is, increasingly I've just been thinking, I mean, I, I'm, maybe you've heard me say this before, or talk about this before, but like for me, um, for me, so much of criticism happens in conversation and in conversations like the one that I imagine we're going to have. And, and I increasingly just think that what I want to do is, is, is do more events like this, uh, do, do more events with authors, which I really like because I like kind of generating in conversation with an author and argument about their, their book. That's one of my favorite things to do. And I suppose I, I suppose I feel less of that urge nowadays to like put my work out there and more just trying to figure out how I can actually stage conversations with people because that's what feels more and more important to me. So I don't have a good answer for you, but, but I will say I've been, I've been getting lots of nice emails from people who previously were only kind of Twitter avatars and I really like emailing. So that's what I've been putting my energy toward. It's just like emailing with people about books. And I don't know, maybe we'll all go back to something very old fashioned, like letter <laughs> writing or. <laughs> that, does, that sounds nice. Yeah, I like yeah. That. Uh, or yeah, I, I I don't know, but I do feel a, I I was feeling a sense of exhaustion with the possibilities of the medium. But then I hear about like what Kim is doing, and I'm like, oh, I wish I was I wish I was back and seeing the spreadsheet, seeing it updated, seeing everybody sharing what they're reading, seeing what people are saying about you know reading or rereading the Hearing Trumpet, which I also love, and you know Carrington is one of my great great literary loves. Uh, so, so you guys are, you guys are making it, making it tempting in a way. <laughs> oh no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> break up, let's break up of my life. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to do that, Trevor. I'm just sitting here yeah. thinking like, yeah. she, she does have that friend who's holding her account. So there's still a chance, you know. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> I do. Well, yeah, or she can hijack it and use it for truly <laughs> things. Who knows? Yeah. Be better, and she's one of your students, you say? Do you have <laughs> control of her grades? <laughs> no, she's one of my graduate students. Oh, we were friends actually before she became one of my graduate oh. students. But I'm just I'm I'm telling all of you so that there is a a historical record of who has access to that. <laughs> just in case, just in case. Oh, wonderful. Well, I'm excited to get to the dry heart, but we always do, uh, you know, following backlisted, which is a tradition that Paul and I have had since the beginning. Just ask each other, what have you been reading? We can be as brief as, as anybody wants to be. Um, <laughs> but I am curious, you know, I, I love to hear uh, what Paul has been reading. And uh, I wanted to invite you both, Kim and Mervé, to sh if you want to, to share as well. Um, but... Paul, what have you been reading? I think I might know. You, you put it on my Instagram yesterday, unless you've uh, 
finished and started something new. <laughs> Not quite yet. Yeah. That's always the spoiler when I post it on your Instagram the day before. No one else knows. Prize. It's just yeah, me. That's true. That's true. Um, so I've been reading a couple different things, but the one I was going to highlight today is the biography of X by Catherine Lacey, which has been getting a lot of, a lot of buzz online. Um, so for those who don't know, it's, it's a really fascinating and ambitious book set in a alternate United States where the Southern states have basically seceded from from the U.S. and form something known as the Southern Territory. And um, they've even gone so far as to build a wall separating those two um, areas. But the interesting thing is that is an important part of the book in some ways, but in some ways it's really not. It's more about, you know, this woman who is tracking down details about her wife who has passed away, known as X, and um, so a lot of it is just her interviewing these different people and, and trying to track down this very intriguing and mysterious person who she was married to, who she finds out she did not know many of the things about her past that she thought she did. And so I have not quite finished it. Merve will not spoil it for me, I'm sure. But um, <laughs> no, but yeah, I, I have a feeling that there might be some interesting things lying ahead in the last, you know, 15% that I have left or so. Um, one of the really fascinating things about it, though, is in this alternate reality, she has sprinkled in all these real life people. You know, there's David Bowie, there's Kurt Cobain, but they are alternate versions of themselves. And interestingly enough, um, one of our guests today actually makes an appearance. And this time around, it's not Kim. Merve <laughs> actually gets name dropped in the middle of this book. But correct me if I'm wrong, Merve, it is not quite you. It is, um, I think the timing of it is such that I don't think that was probably a direct quote from you, right? No, no. Yeah, she does. It's quite, um, it's funny. She, Catherine and I did an event together for the, for the book. And I was asking her what inspired her to take the names of people who are her contemporaries, people who are in their, you know, mid thirties nowadays and, mm -hmm. and make them into characters who were in their mid thirties in the mid eighties mm -hmm. when most of us were actually born. And she said, it was just too hard to think up of, to think <laughs> new character names so i just use the names of people that i knew yeah. <laughs> and it's I so fun that was, that was funny she's very funny yeah she seems like she is it, another example of her humor like ronald reagan is mentioned but he's a member of the green party in this right. alternate reality which i thought was pretty <laughs> funny so anyway right. yeah it's a really ambitious interesting book and i'm really enjoying it i you know in the guardian i'll just read really quickly she had a quote she said i liked the idea of writing a fake biography and the bi biographies I like best are usually written by someone with some kind of compromised perspective. I thought the worst person to write a biography would be a surviving spouse with a bit of a grudge, but I didn't want to get into the heterosexual dynamics of a man writing about a woman or a woman writing about a man. It had to be two women. Yeah. And she said at the same time, I wanted the novel to be set in the mid 20th century, but I wasn't interested in writing about the actual struggles of a prominent lesbian couple that they would be having at the time. So my alternate reality grew out of that problem. I thought if I have an America where this female artist could exist, and this couple could exist without having to justify themselves. I just need a totally different America. So it was just yeah. really interesting oh, to read about her mindset going into it and like how it all came about. So anyway, like I said, I still have to finish it up, but I'm really enjoying that one. I got that. You've read it too, Kim? Yeah. So I'm the only one. I do have it. I'm excited to read it. But now I'm, I'm, I'm just more excited now. <laughs> yeah, her imagination is impressive. And and the footnotes in that book mm. and then the end notes too are really, are really just as much fun to read as the actual text itself. Absolutely. It also, it would have been one thing to do this kind of metafictional fake biography, which in and of itself is a tremendous, is a tremendous task mm. to set out, mm. to set out on as a, as a novelist. And that part of it reminds me a lot of a novel like Pale Fire mm. by Nabokov. Uh, especially with the kind of the density of the footnotes in it as well. But then to add onto that, this really elaborate counterfactual history and yeah. to manage to balance those two the way that she does, I thought it was really extraordinary that she pulled it off. It really because was, because it, it could have gone wrong. Ways it could have gone wrong. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And you appreciate those books, I think, the ones where you're like, I could see how this could have gone terribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Breathe a sigh of relief that the novelist managed to manage to escape unscathed. Absolutely. Well, she's one of the, I have read the first page. That's what made me go buy the book. 
it, it seems like she is in control from the start. I mean, we'll talk about a great first page here in a little bit when we get to the dry heart, but the biography of X, that was, I just, that's why I bought it. I didn't know. I still didn't, you know, Paul shared things now about it that I did not know <laughs> because I hadn't, hadn't looked into it too much, but just her control in that first little bit was so captivating that I thought, Oh, I'm excited for this. And like I say, now just more excited. So, <laughs> yeah. well, so I, I think I may have mentioned last time that we were on that I was uh, finally reading um, and well, finishing up the Chronicles of Barset by Anthony Trollope. Mm-hmm. And I did that. I got through the last Chronicle of Barset, feeling a little bit of, of grief, you know, like the, like I've left home uh, for mm-hmm. some reason. And it's been, it's been an, an excellent journey that I started when, after we'd started this podcast, The Warden was one of my favorite books of 2020, mm-hmm. no, 2021. Boy, okay. The last few years, I'm sure for all of us have been a little bit hard to keep track of specifically, but yeah, 2021 and then uh, the Barchester Towers of 2022. And then I, you know, went through the rest of the three this year and it just was such a wonderful experience. I loved his little asides, his entering the narrative. Um, You know, he just had this kind heart and always, always manages to, even the worst characters pull back a little bit and say, but hold on a second. You know, this person had some virtues too, and it's those virtues that made her start to feel bad about what had just happened, you know, and kind of going on it like that. So just such a, a kind of an emotional, emotional journey, but that has, that was, that was fun. And I wanted to bring that up. The, the book I'm reading now is actually Patrick DeWitt's The Librarianist, hmm. which I was excited about um, because I've really enjoyed his his work. You know, he's got three other novels out, starting with The Sisters Brothers about a decade ago. This is not like any of them, and certainly not like The Sisters Brothers. It is very much more of a quiet. The, the main uh, protagonist is starts out the novel as an older man in his 70s who has retired from his career as a librarian. And he... he wants to he runs into someone who is in kind of a I, I'm going to use the wrong words probably so that's why I'm hesitating but it's a it's a woman who is in a care facility uh but who clearly doesn't have um her you know memories and all of uh all of her wits about her and so he takes her back and decides hey I'm going to start reading to these people maybe that'll help them and mm-hmm. it just goes wrong they don't care at all they all leave before he's done reading you know something by Gogol or, you know, it's just not going well. Um, But the book does, you know, I say, I'd say in, in Patrick DeWitt fashion, keep coming up with surprises. Um, It goes back into the past and then back into the past again. So I am really enjoying it, but I, I feel like I was lulled in. It's not very much about books or libraries. So Mm -hmm. I was a little bit sad about that and still am because I'm thinking, Oh, he could have just been anybody you know, who was dedicated to his craft or his job throughout the years, because he's, he's not very passionate. And that's part of the book. And, you know, again, very different from the Sisters Brothers, for example, but I am I am enjoying it. So I bring that up, too, because it was a book that I mentioned clear back at the start of the year is one I was most looking forward to, to reading. And now it's mm-hmm. out and, and I'm, I'm in a I'm in a, I'll, I'll share how it how it goes, you know, what I, what I feel about it at the end. Um, Kim and Mervey, I, I, did you want to share what you've been reading? And and we can, if, if you're both shaking your head, yeah, okay, so Kim, do you want to start and then we'll... Sure, I'll start. I'm actually, um, I just started our new NYRB Women 23 mm-hmm. read, um, which is The 10,000 Things by Maria Dermo. Um, and it was published initially in Holland in 1955. Um and it, we don't know very much yet because we're only a couple days in. I haven't read today's pages either, but it starts. Um, it's very. It starts in the landscape of the islands um, in Indonesia, and it's it's very lush and descriptive, and you feel like you're just you're very set in the place. Um, so I thought I would just read the little blurb on the back since we don't know very much about the story yet. Um, But The 10,000 Things is a novel of shimmering strangeness, the story of Felicia, who returns with her baby son from Holland to the spice islands of Indonesia, to the house and garden that were her birthplace, over which her powerful grandmother still presides. There, Felicia finds herself wedded to an 
to an uncanny and dangerous world full of mystery and violence where objects tell tales, the dead come and go, and the past is as potent as the present. And you definitely, we are already getting a sense of um, kind of the ghostly inhabitants of the island and the other inhabitants. And it's been really, it's beautiful so far. And it is a very strange world so far. I've been enjoying it. <laughs> have, you, have either of you read that, Paul Mervay? No, I'm going to order it now, though. That sounds fantastic, Kim. Yeah, it's this really, it's really, the writing is beautiful. The translation is by um, Hans Koning um, from the Dutch, and it's beautifully translated. So when I'm did excited it, when to did get it first, When was it originally published? 1955. 1955, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that sounds wonderful. Oh, it is an interesting read, um, you know, to your point, Trevor, about f- following up on Silvino Ocampo, because it is just enough, like you're trying to figure out kind of what's happening in this in this environment and and there's um a mention of three girls that have died and their graves and and then just all these other kind of ghostly inhabitants so mm-hmm. you're definitely like unsettled from the very beginning but in a beautiful lush landscape while you, while you're in that place uh, as you can say there's a quote on the back by eudora welty and so i was surprised that it, it i don't I don't even hear about it now that it's been published by NYRB Classics. I still don't hear about it very often. It's mm-hmm. not a book I was familiar with. And that could just be me, but it does seem to be beloved um, pretty much since it was first published. Yeah, and the so. translation was done in 1958. So it was translated the same year that it was initially published. Hmm. Well, I'm, 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 I am enjoying it. I think Shimmering Strangeness is the way. It's like it – I don't know. Yeah. The, it's it's a very rich, lush uh, opening to the, to the book. <laughs> yeah, it really is. All right, and, and Mervy, did you want to share what you've been uh, busy reading? Sure. Anything in particular? I yeah, I am supposed to interview Lydia Davis next mm-hmm. month, so I have been rereading all of her work, and right now I am on the second collection of her essays, which are all of the essays about translation. Mm -hmm. And I am finding them just so, so, so delightful. I could live in that book with her voice. And there's this wonderful essay in which she, the one that I just finished last night, actually before going to bed, is this essay in which she describes how she taught herself to read Spanish. And she did it with the Spanish version of the adventures of Tom Sawyer. And the way that this essay proceeds is that it takes a passage from the Spanish edition of the adventures of Tom Sawyer and sentence by sentence, Davis transcribes a sentence. And then in parentheses underneath the sentence that she transcribes, she talks about how she translates the sentence without a dictionary using just her knowledge of like some basic, like elementary school level Spanish plus cognates Uh, and then sort of guessing at things. And so that goes on for a couple of pages. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a passage that's maybe 20 sentences. And so she does that for 20 sentences and she translates what she can, she leaves what she can't translate in Spanish, and then she kind of strings it all together, first as a sort of prose poem, and then as a smoothed over translation of her own. And then she gives you the original English from which it was rendered into Spanish. And to me, it was wonderful for two reasons. The first, because I think we do often wonder what the actual practice of translation looks like on the page. Like if we had to take a translator's thoughts and write them down as they were trying to figure out what word to use for this word or how to make this sentence work or whether to follow a sentence grammatically or kind of rearrange it so that it seems more idiomatic in English, what does that actual process look like? And Davis gives us that blow by blow. And so I found it really lovely for that reason. And then the other reason I'm realizing that I found it lovely, uh, and this gets back to the first part of our conversation, is that each sentence and each translation of it is kind of like tweet sized. <laughs> <laughs> and you could, you could almost, I mean, I was almost imagining it as a sort of thread 
that is not all that different from the threads that someone like Emily Wilson does when she talks about how she's translating bits from the Iliad or from the Odyssey. And I was thinking, oh, this is such a great, great use or a great function for the, the miniaturism of someone like Davis, but also the sort of sentence level miniaturism of the translator. And, and so that's what I've been, that's what I've been reading. And I've just been having a really, really, really nice time with it. I've also been reading her translation of Madame Bovary next to Paul Damon and Eleanor Marx's translation of Madame Bovary, which is a kind of like a, a howlingly bad translation. <laughs> right. So, so that's also been quite fun having, having the really clean, really beautiful translation next to this like pretty, pretty awful turgid one. <laughs> that is so interesting to read translations side by side like that. We just did um, in Silvino Campo, I had read the, her um, first collection of short stories had been translated in um, an edition from City Light Books. And it's a different translator than the Thus Were Their Faces collection. And so it was interesting to lay a couple of the stories side by side and compare. Um, and the translations are vastly different. Yeah. And you don't even need to do it for the same text. Like, I'm, you know, I've so I've now read, I think, everything that Yun Fossa has written. And Damien Searles did his most recent novels. But the translator of the translator, it's a different translator for the earlier novels. And there's just a you can even tell from from one novel to the next what a huge difference the sensibility and the approach of the translator of the translator makes. And Davis is so wonderful in this way because she does have such a kind of idiosyncratic idiosyncratic sensibility and an idiosyncratic vocabulary that lets her reach for certain words when someone else would probably reach for another. But her, she's also tremendously logical. And the way that she lays out her logic makes you see how something like, how something like logic and style can coexist. Mm in this really wonderful and, and intricate way. So I'm just having, yeah, I'm just having a, I'm having a blast with it. And next up is her great, uh, great breakup novel, The End of the Story, which I don't know if you guys have read, but it's probably my favorite, <laughs> my favorite story about coming to terms with the end of a relationship and how it makes you look back at the beginning of the relationship and when you can look back at the beginning and how you look back at the beginning. It's wonderful. Oh, how interesting. I'm adding that to my list. Yeah, that's a reread for me. But it's, it's really, it's it's her only novel and it's fantastic. Merve continues to have her dangerous effects on me. Like I think of all the books that <laughs> yeah. you talk about or write about and I'm like, oh, look at that. Like Orlando Furiosa, when you were going through that line by line, I'm like, I, I saw it at the used bookstore and I picked it up immediately, sight unseen, just based on that. And I was like. Oh, that's great. I love the Furiosa. It's so funny. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I. I like, see now, this is so terrible because I started by telling you guys that I, you know, best breakup, never looking back. And now I'm like, but of course the form is great for doing something like going mm. through the Furioso one canto, mm. one canto at a time. I or what that. Lee Wilson's doing or what Lydia Davis is doing in this essay. So, you know, there, there, there are, yeah, there are things that the form is <laughs> really, is really appropriate for, but. Now you're just going to be bombarded by all of us with emails. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to call my sponsor every morning. And be like, <laughs> exactly. Remind me why, remind me why not. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lydia Davis, I first got to know her work at all through her translation of No Tomorrow by Vivant Deno when yeah. she did that for NYRB Classics. And oh my word, that was so much fun. And then I went and read her first, uh, the, the selected stories, and I couldn't believe how different they were. I think you're talking about her idiosyncratic vocabulary and her, her logic and all of that kind of coming together in style. I, I, I loved it all. And so I, I, yeah, I'm putting the novel down uh, on my list as well. So mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I like these very logical, these, these women who have a real, I I'm realizing, you know, you realize that you have certain like beats or you have certain kinds of works that you gravitate to. Kim, it's funny. I was, I was actually on the phone a couple of weeks ago with another one of my graduate students who's writing this dissertation on like dissociated women wandering around New York in the mid century. And all of those books are by, are published by the New York review of books. And we were like, oh, that's there. 
it is like, such a great it's list. Archive. Yeah. Yeah, that's their, that's their archive. It's like women alienated from their bodies wandering around a city trying to figure out how to like reattach <laughs> to reality in one way or another. Um, but I'm realizing that these women with these almost like mathematical attachments to language that manifests in this in these ideas about logic mm. and its relationship to style that that seems to be something that I keep keep coming back to so le bon roi à mis sa culotte à l'envers le grand saint éloi lui dit au mon roi votre majesté mal culotté well, thank you so much. I think we should probably get on to Natalia Ginsburg's The Dry Heart, the main event of the day and something I'm just, you know, our conversation has just made me more excited uh, to, to get into this, <laughs> if anything, uh, because I love this book so much. And I'm just, I mean, I, I want to sit back and just listen to, to all of you talk about it for a few moments, you know, is, is my is my selfish reason why I started podcasting to begin with is so that I could, you know, sit face to face with Paul, for example, and just, you know, have, have the, the Twitter experience, but in person, you know, from someone that I just have always loved interacting with. And it's so nice, Kim and Murray, to have you here uh, as well, because your thoughts on Natalia Ginsburg and on the dry heart are things that I've known for some time. And I just feel, I feel a little bit greedy that I have, you know, used my machinations to, uh, to very much put together the, the ideal uh, Saturday morning for myself. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Um, but Natalia Ginsburg, um, I, w- this is not a, an episode that is specific to her in general, but I think it's worth, you know, maybe sharing how we came to know her. Um, and, I think the first time that I thought I need to start reading her books, um, I had had a few because NYRB Classics had published them, like Family Lexicon Mm -hmm. and their little dual um, novellas. But it wasn't until I was reading Vivian Gornick's Unfinished Business um, book of essays that she published back at the beginning of the, you know, it came out right right at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, uh, Notes of a Chronic Rereader. And she has an essay in here about, uh, about Natalia Ginsburg that made me stop and say, I need to read one of these little collections of novellas. And I started with the Valentino and Sagittarius, but I, and and I, I loved it. I loved it so much, but I really like what she says here at the start of this essay. She says, a writer whose work has often made me love life more is Natalia Ginsburg. Reading her as I have repeatedly over many years, I experience the exhilaration that comes with being intellectually reminded that one is a sentient being. First time time around, my eyes were open to something important about who I was at the moment of reading, later to who or what I was becoming. But then I lived long enough to feel a stranger to myself, no one more surprised than me that I had turned out to be who I am. And reading Ginsburg again has provided solace as well as revelation. And I just... That's what made me think, okay, I need to go in and read her her books. And she's swiftly become one of my favorites. As we've been preparing for this episode, a lot of people have said, oh, we're reading her for the first time, or I'm rereading The Dry Heart, or I've read some, but not The Dry Heart. And man, she's really becoming one of my favorite authors. It just seems that uh, you can't you can't not read her work and, and be touched by it in some ways. And I'm, I'm not even sure how it has, how it has affected me entirely. Um, fortunately with the uh, Gornick's uh, pathway paved in front of me, I can just keep rereading them throughout my life. But, but the, definitely the one that first really kind of, you know, grabbed me by the throat and pulled me through it was the dry heart. Um, which I think is similar to some of her other stories, but just has a very unique structure, I think, to what she had done before. Uh, well, she only, I think she only had one or two things done before, but and what, what I had read before, I guess, is a better way of putting it. But really just uh, excited to to hear a little bit from, from you about your experience with uh, Natalia Ginsburg, but also the Dry Heart in particular. And then we'll get into some of the some of the unique things. I mean, I've got some some thoughts here um, about the structure, you know, why start with the, the end (laughs) in a way, or at least a piece of the end and, uh, other, other things I want to, to, to get thoughts on, but very much want this to be a free flowing conversation that, uh, I just want to, you know, so I, as I've always put this and Paul and I have talked about, 
it's like we're just gathering around a dinner table on a nice evening and and being able to share some thoughts on on books rather than feel constricted to a particular um, rhythm or anything like that. But um, maybe Paul, Paul, this was your first time reading the Dry Heart, right? Mm-hmm. It was. And yeah, I think the rest I, of us had this was a reread, am I right? Or at least, yeah, you know, yes. we've read it before. So yeah. welcome to the to the party, Paul. Yeah. Quite I'm, a party. <laughs> I'm a little bit surprised you managed to put it off because I remember when you were in a bookstore and you said, Hey, what should I get? And I said, yeah. I sent you a picture of the first page of the dry heart and said, Get this one. Yeah. And right. you read it and bought it, but then you didn't you know, you didn't stop in the middle of the bookstore and, and start reading it in line, I don't think. so. <laughs> Only because I always have a constant teetering stack on my nightstand that <laughs> demands my attention. But yeah, I was in Nashville at Ann Patchett's bookstore. And yeah, I was desperately messaging you like, I have a stack of 10. I can only get five. Which one should I get? <laughs> and luckily you talked me into the dry heart, which didn't take much arm twisting. But yeah, um, this was my first time, but I had come to read Ginsburg's work. I don't know a specific time, but over the last few years, I think just the cumulative buzz of so many people I trust online combined with, you know, we've talked about certain publishers. We just trust them, you know, NYRB and New Directions. I mean, the combination of those two, I I didn't hold up very long before I was buying way more of the books before I read them. Um, But like you, I think (laughs) one of the, the first one that I read was Valentino and Sagittarius. And I have very strong memories of taking it on a hike with me because it was so slim and I could stick it in my backpack and stopping somewhere in the mountains and and just sitting by the side of the trail and reading that. So it's just, we talk a lot about those moments of time as a reader where it just solidifies into this really wonderful experience. And that was absolutely the case. So yeah, those pairings of novellas are so much fun that they keep putting out. And then Family Lexicon is absolutely wonderful as well. But I got to say, The Dry Heart, I mean, I don't know that I'm going to rank any favorites, but it's it's way up there based on my first reread. And I'm already looking forward to rereading it because it's so complex. And like you said, structurally, emotionally, there's so many things going on that I think it's one of those books that would just benefit from many rereads. So, You know... I, I discovered her because I was writing, it was one of uh, an early piece that I did for Book Forum on an essayist named Mina Zal- Zalman Proctor, who it turns out is also one of Ginsburg's translators. She translated happiness as such. And I think it's in Proctor's own essay collection that she mentions the little virtues as an essay collection that is quite acute and quite moving, but not at all confessional. It has a very kind of cool and very distant tone to it. And so I think The Little Virtues was the first thing that I read by Ginsburg and then read Happiness as such because I was writing about Proctor and then Family Lexicon and came to The Dry Heart because I received it in a batch of novellas from New Directions, Uh, but was totally blown away by it. And it was funny because, you know, I was just talking about Davis, who, of course, translated the first volume of Proust from French into English. And Ginsburg was the first Italian translator, I think, or one of the first Italian translators of Proust from French into Italian. And for me, what's been extraordinary or what is extraordinary about the dry heart is seeing the way that she's engaging with a particular tradition of male pathos and a particular kind of male figure who is often made into the sensitive hero or the longing man of high (laughs) European novels. And the way that she is wrenching that tradition away from that kind of character and doing it in this wonderfully compressed and violent form. That's what was really appealing about it, about it to me. I, oh, I um, love that. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'll, I'll stop, I'll stop there, but that's the journey. You know, dry heart came quite late actually in my introduction to Ginsburg. And I don't think, I mean, I, I really love the little virtues and, and I liked family lexicon too, but this is the one that's always really, that's, that's really, stayed with me. Yeah, I first, um, I first discovered her, I think in 2020. And it's, I, it's interesting, I discovered her through Silvino Ocampo, which is random. Um, But Silvino Ocampo was the first person that I had come across that I realized that there is 
there were all these lost women of literature that I had never heard names of before. And I started after reading Sylvia Ocampo, I started just kind of looking into other women from around the world that I didn't know about. And um, Natalia Ginsburg's name came up. And I first read The Little Virtues. Um, that was my first introduction to her. And it's a beautiful collection of essays. And I was so taken by her her economy of language and um, and her unsentimental way of, of looking at things. And The Dry Heart was the second book that I picked up. And it was, I was in the bookstore and I had read the first the, the first page. And I was like, okay, this is the one I'm going to go with next. And I was so captivated Im- immediately by the story. And I went home and read it immediately. And, um, and it, it, I mean, just to start with, to start with what has transpired and then to, to work your way back and to find out what led up to that moment. I just thought it was such a brilliant form. And um, I was, I, I just had never read anything like it. Yeah, I love that. I can can we can we switch gears to the beginning? Is that okay? Please do. Yeah, whatever. And, and I think also this is the summer book club, so feel free if you're if you're trying to avoid spoilers. I think we can maybe say everybody. Uh, hopefully, you've read the book, and if not, go read it short. But I I think feel free to talk. Uh, yeah. Well, feel free to talk freely <laughs> about the 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 spoilers or anything like that that you might otherwise want to avoid. Well, but actually it's so interesting that you start with that disclaimer about spoilers because as Kim pointed <laughs> out, this is a novel that bege- a novella that begins at the end. Mm-hmm. I and I don't think I would be spoiling it if I asked one of you to just read the first what is it, the first page mm-hmm. from the first from the first sentence to the uh, to the the shots fired. Could someone just, I don't have it in front of me. Could someone just read those for, for the benefit of, of listeners who haven't read it? And then we can spoil it, I feel, but like responsibly. We're spoiling it. There you go. There you go. Yeah. That's a good idea. I, I feel like, Kim, do you have it? I do. I have it right in front of me. Are you okay do you want doing me to read it? it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tell me the truth, I said. What truth? He echoed. He was making a rapid sketch in his notebook, and now he showed me what it was. A long, long train with a big cloud of black smoke swirling over it and himself leaning out of a window to wave a handkerchief. I shot him between the eyes. Do you want me to keep reading? No, that's per- I mean, that's perfect, right? Because, yeah, because that's, it. <laughs> that's it. That's it, right? But, and that's what? That's that's two paragraphs, three paragraphs, if I remember. Yeah, right. it's, it's, two, it's two lines and one paragraph. <laughs> okay, so now we've spoiled it. <laughs> And we can and we can talk about it. So to to me, there are just there are three things that are incredible about that opening. The first is the uh, the the lines that are exchanged or the speed the dialogue that's exchanged between these two people. Tell me the truth. What truth? He echoed. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you can just feel. I mean, it's only uh, what six seven words. And you can feel behind those six, seven words, an entire history of deceit mm-hmm. and withholding mm-hmm. and frustration and anger. And Kim, to what you were saying about her economy of language, it's it's extraordinary how she sets that up in just that exchange. Uh, and that exchange kind of weighted by what comes after it. But then the second thing, and I, I feel like I noticed this more on the reread, is the particular sketch that he's making mm-hmm. of himself on a train <laughs> waving goodbye, presumably uh, to this woman, but maybe not, maybe to somebody else. And the absolute smugness of that image. And then I also realized this time reading it, when she says she shot him in the eyes, there's a kind of, between the eyes, there's a kind of confusion between whether she's shooting the sketch mm-hmm. that he's, between the eyes or whether she's shooting him between the eyes. And I I was trying to puzzle out what that confusion uh, was was about. Um, and I have a couple of hypotheses, but I just want I just want to start with those with those observations because on the reread, I was so impressed by how much happens, how much is suggested, and where the 
where the emphasis on description lies in those in those opening lines. And these opening lines are repeated, or at least maybe not the opening lines, but this scene, those particular elements are repeated three or four times mm-hmm. throughout yeah. the book, including at the very, very end. At each time, it's still shocking uh, to, to me. And yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Kim. Yeah. And each time you're given a little bit more. And so it, it keeps changing your perspective on what is happening. Plus, you have all the information that she's kind of giving you between when, you know, bef- between when she brings it up. And so this relationship is unfolding and you're you're experiencing her like her own kind of demise as mm. a wife along with it. Well, and it's but so interesting. Also- oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, Paul. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, it's just interesting because what you just said, you get a little more information every time that that scene is repeated. And in many ways, it confirms what you may have guessed from the opening lines. But then what Mm -hmm. I liked about it, too, is there's so much complexity and so many gray areas. And and I felt a little wrong footed every time it was reintroduced because it was kind of what I thought, but it was also a little bit different. So it was just fascinating that it could have been a very straightforward scene that you then got confirmed, you know, throughout the book. But there was some some interesting wrinkles there that I thought really kind of messed with my mind a little bit too. Well, and she I says think, she, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say I think what you said earlier, Merve, about hit, her kind of taking this uh, the 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 longing man and mm. you know this artistic or so so he might consider himself or something you know uh, man and. Re, re, redoing it, that's something that changes throughout for me, as Paul's just mentioning. Like, at first, he just kind of looks like he might be an absolute philanderer. You know, the first time I read it, I'm like, I don't know who this guy is, but he looks like a jerk. Just smug, like, you know, waving to her as he rides off on the train. Um, uncaring. But she does present him as someone who who probably in his own imagination, and I think imagination is such a big part of this book, but his own imagination sees himself as, you know, quite this emotional, uh, his, his own journey is so important to, to him. But I love that, uh, Ginsburg doesn't really let him have it. He's, mm-hmm. he's not anything impressive. He, 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 he just kind of falls apart throughout and you start to see that he's not even that, that, maybe Quintus, like you might see in old Italian cinema of uh, the kind of charismatic um, older man who still is able to philander all the time. It's like, no, he's kind of pathetic throughout. Yeah. And, and I, I love that, that that's how she's kind of recaptured that. And I had not thought about that before. Well, she, you know, what, what comes immediately after those lines that Kim read is the narrator's uh, confession, as it were, where she says, I knew that this was going to happen eventually. <laughs> Sooner or later, I would put him out of his misery. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I think that's what's interesting about starting with the, with the murder, with the gun going off, because the question isn't what's going to happen. The question is, why did it take this long? For it to happen, why didn't it happen? Why, why did it take four years of marriage for it to happen? Why didn't it happen in year two or in year three? What was it that led to this point as the breaking point, the moment when she snapped? And that's why when you get, as Kim was saying, both the scene itself repeated with more information, more dialogue being fleshed out, but also the backstory of how they got to that point in the first place, you, you, start, to, you start to create a kind of timeline of what happened when and why, why given this character's or these characters' psychologies, this was the, the breaking point of his life and their, and their marriage. It would have been a completely different book in my in my opinion had she done what most of us probably would do and start with her, you know, kind of – well, where she starts after the initial scene with her single and, and kind of wanting something else and doing that uh, menial work. And then here comes a man who she doesn't – she doesn't know what love is and she doesn't really think she loves him. In fact, he kind of disgusts her. But there's something about what she wants and what she imagines her life will be that that 
gets them together. It would be easy to start there Mm -hmm. and then slowly, you know, he keeps a gun. He, you know, this is getting worse and worse. And we're all sitting there waiting for what's going to happen in that study. You know, the, 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 that would be quite a different experience, I think, than starting out with the, with the execution, (laughs) putting him out of his misery, as you said at Mervy. Um, And, knowing that that's where all of this is leading inevitably. And I, and I love that, that I love the, the ideas as to why that changes it and making it not about what's going to happen, but, but why now? And, and I, I love the way you start your essay that you, you did for, uh, your, you know, besides Natalia Ginsburg for public books, Mervay, mm-hmm. where you start it with when should a woman kill her husband? <laughs> and then I have turned this question over and over in my mind. <laughs> Well, I would just hire someone to do it. I don't, I don't do it. <laughs> like your own hands dirty. But, but no, that's such a great, that's such a great point because one of the things, you know, of course the question that happens anytime a novel or a novella opens with a murder, particularly a novel or novella narrated in the first person, the, the first thing that happens in any reader's mind is like, you wonder how reliable this narrator is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and to what extent we trust their account of things. And this is why getting that scene over and over again is, is especially important, Paul, as you said, the kind of ripples that it introduces become mm-hmm. ripples of you know, reliability mm-hmm. and, and honesty. Um, but what struck me on this reread too is how much our narrator's emphasis on her early life, when she takes us back, how much the emphasis on the early life is an emphasis on her um, on her imagination, as you were saying, Trevor, right? We learn about her as a kind of lonely girl with a hyperactive imagination who comes to the age of 26 and nothing has happened to her. And you're right that Alberto, who we haven't named him yet, but Alberto, who is in his 40s and still lives with his mom, is this kind of sad figure. And she's excited by the attention that he gives her. But one of the things we learn in the backstory is that she only falls in love with him when she gets herself ready to meet up with him, when she powders and she primps and she waits for his call and he doesn't Mm -hmm. call. Mm -hmm. And it's not that she misses him, it's that she misses having someone look at her the way that he looked at her and bring her the gifts that he brought her and make her feel like there is a story on the horizon Mm. for her. And so this is a woman who falls in love very much through the operations of her own imagination. Um, And an imagination that's been limited to like sitting in these boarding schools, reading classics, ancient Greek texts to these young, to these young girls. So the question of, you know, what she sees in him, what she expects from him, how she imagines him is, is such a central one to the structure of the, of the novella and the story that it tells, I think. I love the, the, that it's, she has pictured a story, her, how her story, could, a future story, I guess, with him. And we already know how it ends. Right. I just, that's, that, that is something yeah. that I felt too, is I'm like, she's, she's picturing this. She's talking about these fan. She's, she, she has fantasies throughout too, even with uh, Alberto's uh, friend. Is it Agosto? Um, anyway, his friend who's similar age, who, who's writing a book, you know, and, and about Christianity and all this stuff. And it's like, oh man, these, these, these men, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I just watched the Barbie movie the other night. So I'm uh, <laughs> particularly attuned to <laughs> how silly I'm like, I recognize myself in all of these Kens and I'm like, oh man. So thanks for letting, letting me say it with that kind of score, even though I am a man. <laughs> Well, and it's interesting when she first meets him about she's very clear over and over. It's one of the things that's repeated about how she doesn't like him and how her first the first place she goes is like um, thinking that they're going to be friends and that he's going to introduce her to the man that she is going to love. (laughs) And um, and so it's interesting to see how that how her feelings evolve. It's only after like she comes back from visiting her parents and she thinks he's going to visit her and he doesn't visit her. And 
she's sitting in her boarding house room. I think she said powdered and primped. And she repeats that several times in the book as well. Um, And she said that's when she fell in love with him is just sitting in her room. And so all of that is happening in her imagination. She's she's playing this relationship out that doesn't actually really exist. Well, she doesn't like the reality of it either because she's disgusted by him when they're actually together. And, and so the reality is not nearly as interesting as what she has in her mind and how that, how that connects her to him still in some really strange ways, how that imagination versus reality kind of chains her to feeling like it might be her. That's the problem. Um, And, Oh, yeah. Do you do you believe her? I mean, because the other thing too, right, is that we are getting all of this. We are getting all this remembrance from a woman who is now sitting outside of her house where she has shot her husband, uh, trying to decide whether or not to go to the police and like getting her story straight. Right. So part of the interesting question of that remembrance and of that backstory is how much is it being fudged for the purpose of justifying what she has done, perhaps even to herself? And so one way of justifying either, you know, breaking up with someone or murdering them is, well, I didn't like them that much to begin with. It was never like it was just by by virtue of my extremely overactive and sophisticated imagination that I managed to fall in love with this person. But this person himself just wasn't all that, wasn't all that interesting. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question for you guys is, you know, do you believe that backstory? Uh, Do we read it straight? Or is there another kind of level of, of deception that's taking place as the backstory is is unfolding and maybe even self self deception. Um, I was going to say I think I I think she believes the story. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, to your point about when you first start reading it and you are wondering if she's a reliable narrator, and you kind of expect because of how the story starts that the story itself could be frantic and the the language is so precise and controlled. Um, that you feel that you feel the, the, the suffering kind of simmering underneath. Um, and the language itself gave me the reader more trust in her story. Now I still, I still Mm -hmm. think it's her perspective. We don't know. We're, we're only getting it from one, one perspective. Um, but, but it was interesting how the language played into, my belief as a reader in what she was saying, because she's so precise. Even she gives dates for things like she gives dates for the day her daughter gets sick. And there's, there's like three or four times that she gives a specific date. And I'm like, wow, she's really focusing on the precision of the story here. Mm -hmm. And, and it makes sense. Um, I didn't really put it in the context of she's, she's essentially creating her, um, you know, her, her, um, alibi. Uh, sorry. What's what, oh, her, Paul? her alibi? Her yeah. alibi. Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And, um, and so it, it makes sense that she's trying to get all her facts in order to do that, but it is so precise that it, that helps my belief in the story. Yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, I, I did believe her and I do believe her, but this was my first reading. So now you've given me some things to think about. <laughs> no, but what I was going to say is um, the repetition that- Paul and I are a little bit gullible. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I believe her too. Well, you're bad. It's fine. It's, that's it's, right. You know, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, but what Kim and Merve have both mentioned is like these echoes and these repetitions, you know, primped and powdered. I was going to bring up the same thing. She mentions that at least three or four times. There's the sketches that she mentions probably- 12 or 15 times, you know, he's always sketching. We start to see the revolver starting to appear more and more often. So one thing that I thought was interesting is in a book so slim, how many times that we are going over the same ground or some of the same uh, visuals and some of the same thoughts. So it's kind of interesting because I think in some ways it's just doing the chronological work that we've talked about where it's introducing more and more. But then when you said that she's getting her story straight, Merve, now I'm like, that's kind of interesting because if somebody was kind of building this alibi in their head, that's one of the things they would do is repeat things to kind of make sure that they had it all straight. So I don't 
think that's at least right now, I don't think that's what's happening, but it, you've got me, you got me thinking about it at least. Well, I think about that moment early in Lolita when Humbert Humbert says, you know, you can always count on a murderer for a fancy prose style. Mm. And to me, that's a great joke because I think Kim's right. You count on a murderer for a kind of precise, for a precise, mm -hmm. I was here at this date, at this time, here is what happened uh, in this city uh, on this, on this day. And I, yeah, just rereading it this sense, I was like, oh, this is a woman who is like retroactively litigating this relationship because she needs to get her ducks in order for mm -hmm. when the for when the police come for her. She needs to be able uh, to justify it a little bit. And Merve's, um, that same review that you talked about, you use the terms, I think, like unsentimental and inevitability. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so there's that built into it, too, where, you know, I don't know what that says about the discussion we're having right now, but she is very factual there's not a whole lot of emotion i mean she does talk about emotions she's felt in the past but in the moment it feels like she's just recounting what happened and so you know i think that plays into it too it's really interesting it's it feels from the beginning like this was bound to happen no matter what which could be read as look at this guy he, de he deserved what he got or it could be if you're looking at it through that lens you know um you know look just it could be viewed as more of her kind of justifying it after the fact well, it's also, there There are two deaths that are mentioned in the beginning. So there's mm. her shooting him. And then she mentions that their baby died. Mm -hmm. And that to me is like the, that is the, the true grief around which all this unsentimentality is being mobilized. Right? Well, that, that's and, interesting. Yeah. No, no, I'm ahead. sorry. It, it's interesting because she talks about um, her baby dying. And y at first you don't know, like, did a baby die on die in childbirth or how early did the baby die? And then you realize the baby is actually an infant. Like the mm -hmm. baby is eating biscuits and, um, and getting around. And I mean, the baby is a little bit older and, um, and you don't really realize you don't realize that when you first read it. And so I think that's interesting too, because she keeps giving right. you these little nuggets. And I found my imagination going places of trying to figure out what that was going to mean. And then mm. being surprised a lot of times by when I, when she gets further into the story and you keep finding out more and more and more, it kept being surprised by those details. There's something about the matter of fact tone that reminded me of uh, Barbara Cummins uh, books, Our Spoons Came from Woolworths and The Vet's Daughter. And so I probably because of those books, as I read it, I, I tend to look at it almost as a processing mechanism more than a deliberate or even even trying to I mean processing, I guess, is a, is a sense of trying to get yourself to understand your own story. Um, but something that that is from, is similar in those narrators who are maybe maybe could be perceived as a bit naive but are exceptionally articulate all the same, even in, in some kind of simplicity. Mm -hmm. And they've been through, especially in our spoons came from Woolworths, a sim almost a similar, in some ways, similar situation of a, a marriage that is, you know, certainly not what, what was imagined. It could be um, the death of a, of a child and the sense of almost a, an emptiness um, while still trying to tell the story of I can't fully express my emotions here in a part because I don't get them myself, but also because I, I just, I just not there. And that's, it's, it's not too long after, you know, she, she seems to have, have appreciated his attempts, her, her, you know, Alberto's attempts to stick around and comfort her, um, through all of this. And even say, oh, we'll we'll have another child after he's told her he's going to be gone for good. You know, he's now reinserting him back himself back into her life out of pity, but not out of any kind of genuine um, care, uh, according to her, uh, and, and based on what he's kind of saying to her in those in those lines. And you just get this sense that the the state of mind of shock of having committed the act, but also of having lost her child and and just maybe that sense of disgust having returned. All of that seems so mixed up in this matter-of-fact, step-by-step 
um, but still repeating weirdly. It feels step by step, but there's so much repetition throughout this uh, of this this style. I I think it's a miraculous book. I'm 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 blown away that this was one of her her first you know um, her first uh, novellas that, that at least that I could find. I don't have a complete um, list of all of her books or when they were published, but from Wikipedia, this is her second her second novel and follows her own um, tragic uh, history in, in World War II where her, uh, her husband of six years was tortured and executed um, mm-hmm. due to his, uh, you know, being against the, the fascist regime, which she was also a part of. And this is the story she's, she's um, bringing out of that in 1947, you know, three years mm-hmm. after he's gone. And I don't, I don't think there's, I mean, I don't know, but I have no idea of any kind of relation between her biography. That's not what I'm trying to suggest here. She had three children um, with, you know, different situation, but I'm just thinking of that trauma and this sense of how do you move forward? How do you tell a story when it, everything is so fresh and yeah. the, st- the style here just feels so fitting? Yeah. Well, also, who do you tell the story to? I mean, mm-hmm. that's, that's the other question I think we ask of the narrator is who is this being whose benefit is this for and this time around one of the things that struck me and it struck me only because I'm staring at the book on my bookshelf right now is that when Alberto is leaving she's leaving too and one of the books that she that she packs to read when she leaves is Thackeray's Vanity Fair and Vanity Fair I don't know if you guys remember the beginning of Vanity Fair, but Vanity Fair takes its title from Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. And Vanity Fair is one of the kind of stops on the pilgrimage route that the pilgrims take. And it's where there's a kind of uh, a comedic spectacle being staged, uh, but there's there's no audience or they think God is the audience, but it turns out God doesn't show up for the for the play. And I was thinking about this in relationship to what you were saying, Trevor, about about confession and about processing, right? Who are you confessing to? Who are you processing for? I mean, on the one hand, she's thinking about going to the police, but they're not there. And you do feel like she is trying to explain this or justify this to someone. But similar to Vanity Fair, there's no God present that is going to absolve her of what she has done. And I don't think it's an accident in that sense that uh, Alberto's friend Augusto is writing about Christianity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, it is this question of who one confesses to, who absolves us for our sins, who forgives us, uh, who lets us feel our remorse and then move on. That's another, re- that's another set of really active questions in this novella that both the characters seem to be asking themselves in a not totally serious or in an own, only as a kind of intellectual exercise. And then the narrator is really asking that in the process of narrating. It's like that's she- where she's, it's like that's where the book would keep going if it kept going. Cause at the very end, she's, she kind of asks what, where am I going with this? And says it was too difficult to decide. And I felt that the time for conventional and clear cut answers had come forever to a stop within me. It just this, you know, and, and that's a, a, an explicit uh, answer that she gives, or at least a, a, a non-answer to who who is who am I writing this for? It's not Francesca. It's not, you know, uh, who? Um, and yeah, I, I, but but I had stopped there and thought, oh, that's a good ending. <laughs> so I appreciate you kind of pulling that back together for me because I had not considered where what are the implications there of of all this as it relates to her the whole purpose of this even existing these these recollections and this this telling i think that's what makes this book such an interesting reread too because i read it uh, the first time i read it for the story i was just trying to see why she shot him and what happened and but the second time i read it with a lot more questions and i also read it um noticing a lot more detail. Like I, I forgot about the sketches and I, I forgot about just, I forgot about her, uh, about Francesca and that relationship and the relationship to her parents. And there's just so many different, um, there, there was so many different details that I, that just registered so different this time. 
And, um, and to your point, Merve, like just all the questions you're continually asking about who she's writing it for and, and, and what she's remembering. Um, I, I just thought it was such an interesting experience this time around that I didn't, I didn't dial into all that the first time at all. What did you guys think of his affair? Because that's the kind of, hmm. you know, that's the, that's the other big plot point. If it, uh, yeah, that's the other big plot point, right? That she discovers that Alberto has had this relationship with this woman for a very long time and that he and Augusto too have are kind of reenacting the plot of, of Goethe's Young Werther where they have the pistols, mm-hmm. they're thinking about committing a like dual suicide. Uh, what did you guys think about that kind of, the, the capital R romantic aspirations of these men and the, and the affair? I love that you called this book, I think in your article, you called it a um, (laughs) anti-romantic book. Um, I think the the affair, there's so many different layers to um, how it plays into the story because she, I mean, part of it is his feedback as she's answering or she's asking questions of him and he lies about it. And then he tells her he has too much respect for her to lie to her, even though he has been lying to her. And he has respect for her, but he's sleeping with somebody else. And he's constantly talking about, I mean, he's he's constantly talking down about Giovanna and their relationship. Um, so it's interesting to see how, I mean, kind of his his gaslighting is is playing with her mental well-being over the course of the story. And then in addition to that, she, you know, she starts the story with her imagination um, playing out about, about relationships and romance and marriage and all these things. And then with the story on Giovanna, she wants to meet her and understand more about her and see what she looks like and understand what her personality is because she doesn't want to live in her imagination. She wants it to be more concrete. And I thought it was, I, I just thought there were so many interesting details that she that she weaves into the story about that relationship. Well, and the relationship bet- from the men. <laughs> yeah, well, the relationship between the two women I thought was fascinating because I think like we talked about how naive the narrator is or how you know unexperienced, inexperienced she is, and then I think in many ways she's looking at Giovanna and she's like, "What does she have that I don't have?" You know, there's this part where she's talking about her husband and she says his amusement soon palled because he was a man who tired quickly of everything. But then it seems like, except for Giovanna, because then she says, how had she managed to hold his interest all these years? Because she never showed him she loved him, but tormented and deceived him. And so it's almost like she's looking at her and she's like, you know, what, what is she doing? She's, she doesn't treat him as well as I do. And yet that seems to draw him back. And how is it that I keep trying, but she can just keep pulling him back. And so I think there's like that interesting tension, like you said, when they meet, it kind of goes through a few different variations, you know, it's, it's tense, but then there's some understanding for a while, but then by the end it's pretty cold and she's kind of like, you know, browbeating her and just saying like, you know, I'm not interested in you anymore. And so it's like this interesting, complicated thing where she's trying to figure out herself, but also what they have that she doesn't have. I I don't know if I'm, I, I'm still processing this all myself. And, and and I think from what you said at the beginning of her attempt to reclaim this kind of longing, romantic male uh, protagonist, because in many ways, his relationship with Giovanna is also presented as a little bit vacuous. When you hear it from their mouths, he says, oh, you know, it's weird. When I'm not with her, I'm not even thinking about her. I can't take that at face value because clearly something pulls him back in. But I think there may be something to that where he realizes I have two different lives. One's kind of a fantasy where my pain is what is pulled out, where my my torment, these emotions that I that I that some part of me feels are my real life, you know, my passion um, and my pain come out. And then here's my life where I can come and sit in my study and have more of the conventional I just get to to do what I need to do and you kind of take care of things uh, for me. And then you hear from Giovanna as well. And it just feels like they're, 
their affair is more of a of a trope even in their own lives that they just feel like they have to have it to give their to complete their own story um even though they they say it's meaningful and that they know each other so well but it's hard to believe that um in the ways that they kind of act with with each other and here we have our narrator who doesn't it doesn't get a name uh having to deal with all of this in her mind because it's not very clear to her and she's she's still very you know uh young and and trying to figure out how her story fits into all of this and maybe realizing why is this vacuous love affair paramount and and taking up so much of my um, my time as well. Mm. What is it that's missing here? And what would I have if it were, if it were gone, mm-hmm. you know, what's well, my life like without him? I think what you're saying about, about the kind of the, the stories that each of these characters are telling themselves about each other. I think that point is really important because to a certain extent, what we have here are three, four characters four characters, right? Our unnamed narrator, Giovanna, Alberto, and Augusto. Uh, And Francesca, I think, kind of sits outside of this a little bit. She's sort of pragmatic and clear-eyed and not prone to fantasy in the same way as these four central characters are. But there are people who so badly want to have a story to tell that they can only see each other through the scrim of that story world or through the fantasies or tropes, as you said, Trevor, that those particular stories offer them. And to a certain extent, this is a novella about the danger of living in story worlds for too long, which is one of the reasons I think it's quite short. (laughs) Uh, You know, because if you live in these story worlds for too long, if you only see other people as these characters who you've cast to play out these roles for the benefit of your imagination, then you won't see them. And then it becomes easy to kill them. It becomes easy to kill them. It becomes easy to hurt them. It becomes easy to disregard them. And I do think that the shortness of the novella in this case is a testament to wanting to get us out of that story world quickly. Uh, so as not to kind of commit the same mistakes that the four characters are committing, which is that they've just lived in that world too long to have not just any sense of each other's or one another's realities, but even any inclination or curiosity. I, because, you know, like you said, Trevor, at the beginning, the narrator makes Alberto out to be this totally pathetic character, but there are these moments of genuine pathos where you're like, I wonder what the backstory is. Like, mm-hmm. He's really grieving the death of his mother. And we have no idea really how he feels about the death of his own child. And these are all moments where there could be some deeper excavation, but for our narrator, he's just a cork bobbing on the surface of the of the sea. He has no depth that she can access or wants to access or wants to imagine. So it's really a kind of cautionary, there, there's a sense that this feels almost like a fable, a kind of cautionary tale about about the imagination and about what happens when the imagination detaches from reality in this way. There's a quote that you made me think of. It says, I thought how all of us are always trying to imagine what someone else is doing, eating our hearts out, trying to find the truth and moving about in our own private worlds like a blind man who gropes for the walls and various objects in the room. And so, like you said, it's they're always trying to figure out what somebody else is thinking and half the time they're probably getting it wrong. But one thing I like about her is she can be subversive too. And there's another quote about 20 pages after that. And it says, I thought of how men and women spend their time tormenting one another and how stupid it all seems when you're face to face with something like a baby's fever. And I thought that was just so interesting because that's pretty much what 90% of this book is about is women and men spending their time tormenting each other. And she's saying how stupid it is. And like when something like a baby's fever comes along, it kind of sweeps all that away. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting twist that the entire focus of this book in some ways is like superfluous to what reality happens when, you know, like an illness occurs, for example. Yeah. And I think about the baby's eyes, the way the baby's eyes get mm. described in that moment, right? Like that's mm-hmm. the detail of this book. Yeah. Ooh, the two that's... details in this book that have always stayed with me are actually not the details that repeat. And Paul, I think you're right that those ultimately do end up feeling kind of ornamental to like the two 
real things. And for me, the two details that really stay are one, the camel that the baby has, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, that toy camel, it's that, and it's the, the description of the baby's eyes in the moment before the baby dies. Yeah. And that is so, so, so heartbreaking. And you think like these stupid, stupid people mm-hmm. <laughs> who waste their time the way that they have, but this incredibly clever novelist who is not wasting time. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. That's this very, that gives it, it gives it to us in a, this very compact way. And at the heart of that compact narrative is this, is this death of a child, the death of possibility, the death of a life. Uh, and, and, and that really seems to me what's, what's important and everything else that repeats is just kind of swirling around that. I, I need to reread this already because I just, as we're talking about this and trying to get at the truth, I'm like, oh yeah, that's also a central, I mean, the first words are tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. And then the line from Dante that he misquotes is she seeketh, she seeketh truth, which is so dear as knoweth he who for who life for her refuses. Um, There's this sense of seeking and of him. What truth, you know, uh, when, yeah, there's, this is now I'm like, okay, we need to reread and then schedule another conversation exactly. next week to uh... exactly. <laughs> well, that, the bit... a question because we think that he's being evasive there when he says what truth, like, I don't know what you're talking mm-hmm. about. But in fact, like, what truth is she actually seeking here? And mm-hmm. to what extent is she able to stop groping around those private blind interiors of her own mind? to see that the the truth is that she's lost her she's lost her child and she can't there's no way out of that grief and she wants to kill the man who's partially responsible for that child's existence in the first place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I think you're right. That line about her the baby's eyes just oh, stunned me and she said, you know, fr- coming from this young girl who feels like she doesn't know herself, nobody knows her and then the line is um, I looked into her big brown eyes and thought that she knew all there was to know about me. Ooh, just like, you know, she finally found this person who she thinks n- knows her in this world of, of alienation and loneliness. And then that's right before the baby dies. And and like you said, I think that clearly is the catalyst of everything that happens after. So, ooh. All right. Speaking well, which, I think I have to go attend to my own children. I was yeah. just going to say, I think we've come to a point where I have, I have uh, taken everybody away from, from their lives. And I so much appreciate you guys coming and joining. It has been a, a fantastic conversation. I have, again, I love leaving these when I'm realize I'm still not done with this book mm-hmm. and feeling these possibilities along with new insights, but also possible new ways of looking at things and getting more out of it. I think, I think our listeners will be excited to, to get this. So I'll, I will get this uh, uh, edited and, and posted uh, this upcoming week. And, and again, just thanks so much for, for joining us. Um, any final words from Kim or Merve or Paul, any, any of you have any final things you want to share? I would just like to say that I don't like uh, even rereading this. I still feel like there's so much more that I want to go back and explore in it. So I really appreciate this conversation and, and Merve, just all your thoughts on it and the article you wrote have really enhanced my experience with the book. So thank you. Oh no, thank you. I love, I, I, yeah, I absolutely, I, I think this is such a brilliant, such a brilliant novella and yeah, but not would reward five, 10, 20 rereadings. All right. Well, we'll be back listeners next time. Paul, I, I still think you and I keep kicking the can as to what our future topics are going to be. We've had this in, in our, in our mind for a long time as something we were looking yeah. forward to, but we'll get a, you know, we'll be back in a couple of weeks with another episode and, um, We'll, we'll we need one of then. Kim's. We need one of Kim's spreadsheets to get us more organized. Mm-hmm. I think. We do. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put it together for you. Just let me right, know what you, you want on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. You can follow the Mooks and the Gripes and get show notes and book and film reviews at mooksandgripes.com. On Twitter, you can follow Trevor at Mooks and Paul at BiblioPaul. You can also get information about future shows on our Patreon. 
If you'd like to donate to the show, anything and everything, even a dollar a month helps and is deeply appreciated. You can become a Patreon at patreon.com slash mooks. Until next time. Thank you.